Hello, my name's Lorna. I work in developer relations for a company called Ivan. We do uh, data platforms, open source data platforms in the cloud. Not talking about the data platforms in this talk, but feel free to talk to me about them. Uh, my background is in software engineering, and today I'm going to talk to you about engineering documentation. I've had a lot of complaints about this title. People say to me, do you mean how to engineer a documentation platform, or do you mean documentation for engineers? Yes. <laughs> so whichever one of those things you interpreted the talk title as, whichever one you're hoping for, I'm hoping I've got something for you. I'm going to talk a bit about why I chose documentation as my topic, um, a little bit about how I work with the other people um, that I do documentation with, the tools that I'm using, and also a little bit about working with documentation as an open source project, even though it's for a commercial entity. I've been working all year on um, the documentation for Ivan, so you'll hear a lot about specifically this, but I'm also hoping that a lot of these individual small pieces of story or advice or recommendation will be useful to you, whatever you're producing. When I, meet, when I say documentation, I don't just mean formal product documentation, but also blog posts, tutorials, readmes, your internal wiki, whatever it is you are doing, I hope that I have something here that can help you. Engineering is all about solving problems and helping people. I think it's also about enabling people to succeed. Um, I think engineering is actually a caring profession. Um, at, in the UK, I'm involved with an organization called STEM Ambassadors, people who work in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, being available to young people who want to learn more about these industries. And I always tell, usually the teenage girls that I work with, engineering is a caring profession. It's about solving problems, and it's about helping people. When we talk about documentation, it's about engineering a great user experience. And it's about making a great experience for the users, but also for the people who are going to write the content. It is a famous myth, reinforced by our host, that technical people don't enjoy writing documentation. I don't think that's true, but I think it can be frustrating. As technical professionals, we are masters of our craft. We enjoy having great impact by using our skills. For a long time, I didn't recognize writing or documentation as one of my skills. It felt like a really big effort to produce something written. I didn't really know what was expected or what to do. I wasn't practiced at it. I didn't have skills to make it easy and efficient. So engineering means making the effort a little bit smaller and the return a little bit larger. Documentation speaks both for writers and for readers, developer productivity, helping people be successful, and then the experience of the person who uses those resources. Because documentation <coughs> is the most scalable work I have ever done as an engineer. We talk about building scalable systems. If you think about the biggest thing you could build, with your technical skills, and then imagine instead of that, you made it so that other engineers could also build those things. And together, all those people who learn from you build something that is so much bigger than anything that one individual could build. And this is how I became passionate about documentation, about the impact that it can have, and how well that investment really scales. Whether you're working on the internal wiki, the blog, formal product docs, writing tutorials, use the advice that I give you today for your own purposes. Please use it for good. <laughs> 
the documentation or the other resources that you create are, have huge impact. And it's really important that we think about documentation as a product in its own right. It is a developer tool, it is part of our platform, whether your platform is an open source project, a commercial offering or something else. And like all products, it needs a cross-disciplinary team. We need people with many different skill sets to help us be successful in delivering these projects. I've been doing something that I call internal DevRel. We've agreed to call colleague enablement in public. And my, <laughs> my marketing colleagues call tech support for marketing. Um, and it's about bringing the things that I know the technology, the databases, the domain-specific knowledge that, of the product that our company builds, and sharing it with the experts of other disciplines that I work with. At Ivan, developer relations reports into marketing, um, which <laughs> works brilliantly, actually. I've heard lots of terrible things about DevRel and marketing. It works really well. But it means that I work really closely with people who are brilliant at things I will never understand, performance marketing, I don't know, data analytics, things happen. And by giving them a little bit of domain-specific knowledge, helping them understand what Kafka even is, helps them to use their skills to better effect. Earlier in the year, <clears throat> I had a terrible problem. My calendar was completely full. <laughs> I'm tech support for marketing. They book lots of meetings to ask me things. This does not scale. So in an attempt to make it a little bit more manageable, as I was growing a big team at the time, I, <laughs> I said to them, stop. I am going to give do one hour a week. You can pick the topic, and I will explain it to you. So this whole, this whole idea started as one repeating calendar invite that anyone could invite anyone else to, and a wiki page with a list of the topics we would cover on different weeks, um, all the recordings of the old sessions, and the ability to request a new topic. So every week, <laughs> I went along. Um, I started by inviting four people. Within about three months, I had, I don't know, 60 people. Uh, I've been running this all year. I have 100 RSVPs on my calendar invite. For context, Ivan is only a 500-person company today. Um, so <laughs> that's a reasonable percentage um, of people. And through these sessions, I have been trying to give them just enough context to enable them. This is a bit like building documentation for an external audience, giving them the knowledge they need to mix in with their skills that they already have and solve a problem that they understand. Explaining it to sales and marketing is <laughs> a whole new level of explaining technology to different audiences than I have ever tackled before. Um, and it's only worked because the people I work with are open to doing that. And by making that technical information available to my colleagues in a format that makes sense for them, that's enabled them to bring their skills and use them well to help our audience. It lets us share that mission. Ivan's documentation has a lot of contributors. Most of them work at Ivan. It's an open source project. Not all of them do. By definition, most of them are not experts at documentation. Right? They are bringing their domain-specific knowledge. So now we're flipping this colleague enablement idea completely the other way around and teaching the basics of effective documentation to our technical staff who have the content we want to share, but not necessarily the expertise or the experience to be really efficient in getting that content into a great format and published. It's really about teaching engineers the design patterns of creating written content, giving them a framework um, and a system that will help them to use their skills to good effect. We adopted a content framework called Diataxis. If you have seen the Divio documentation format, 
this is that. Uh, Daniele doesn't work at Divio anymore, so it's got its own brand now. The idea here is that we create content that is clearly one of four different types of content. And it's all based around the different stages in the user's journey of learning something new or getting to grips with a new platform. The majority of Ivan users are already experts. They're just filling in gaps for what's different about our platform or perhaps expanding to take on something new alongside what they already know. We lean heavily on particularly the how-to guides and the explanation content. The how-to guides are very prescriptive. They show you how to do one thing. It's a numbered series of steps. There are no options and there's no additional explanation. All of you can think about writing the instructions for someone to do something and all of our content comes out consistent. This is super important when you have a lot of contributors. As we're trying to create a consistent and delightful user experience on our docs, and whether you're writing a wiki or something else, many writers and many readers can make a bit of a, shall I call it a varied experience? <laughs> we don't want to give the impression that we shut some typewriters and some monkeys in a room. <laughs> We want to look like there was a plan all along, but without having a lot of overhead. We use the explanation content quite a bit to introduce people to the content, to the concepts that they might not know. Ivan offers hosted Kafka, hosted Postgres, hosted OpenSearch, insert more data words here. So we link to the upstream documentation a lot, but we also do write our own explainers where we feel like that resource doesn't already exist. The reference content is exactly what it sounds like. It is a list of config variables. You can look up what it is and what the options are. It's a list of the plugins that we have available for Grafana or the extensions to Postgres or the Kafka connectors. It's just something you're going to look up um, and then use that information for something else. Right now, we don't have tutorials. Um, partly because we're migrating off an old system. The tutorials are much more complete. They bring together multiple elements. You, and when you have completed a tutorial, you have built a standalone thing. They're much more than a how-to guide. We have templates for all of these different content types. So if you have never written documentation before, or you have, but you needed a bit more support, these are our content types. There are templates. The first step in the reviewer guidelines is what type of content, can you tell what type of content this is, right? <laughs> and that helps to give structure to the work that we do. It means that as documentation contributors, we don't have to think. We have some templates, we have a mini style guide, and the goal there is to help people write consistently and easily. We have a content structure that encourages this. We've got sections for each product, sections for each tool. Um, there's the concepts and the how-tos are separate in each section. Maybe you're not that excited about my navigation setup. That's fine. <laughs> we have really good search. And I think this is really important for developer experience. Developers know what they need. I'm saying developers, but it's a much more general technical audience with a lot of platform people and a lot of data professionals and everybody in between. They know what they need, so we have really good search. I'm using OpenSearch, which is the open source fork of Elasticsearch, for, to index both the documentation site and our old knowledge base. We're migrating from one to the other, but the search will always find it regardless of where it is currently and if we've moved it lately to confuse you. Um, the search will always pick that up. Being able to index multiple searches, being able to use the open search, search syntax, yeah, really works for this technical audience and I wish every written reference I had to use had this. I've definitely worked at places where it was easier to pull the source of the docs and grep it um, <laughs> than it was to find anything. So I'm aiming to avoid that experience. Just 
putting things um, front and center. I feel like the search has also covered over some of the weaker points in the current doc setup. Um, if you're exploring our docs, there's a whole, there's a thing labeled platform. It's like a bucket of everything we know. <laughs> Somebody needs to sit down with some information architecture and make this much easier to navigate. We haven't done it yet. I'm not going to block anyone from publishing content if it's ready. But the navigation is mm, not all the way there. I wish we had spent more time on information architecture earlier in the process, and I would definitely recommend that if you're looking at a similar project. But the search gives people options, and I think that's important. We have a style guide. It's 10 bullet points in the middle of the contributing file. And what's unusual about this style guide is I have it on good authority that some engineers have read it. Most style guides are written by tech writers for tech writers, and they are book-sized. None of us have got time for that. <laughs> so we've just got some key points about the things that we think are so important that if they're not correct, we wouldn't accept the pull request. Otherwise, really, we'll figure it out. So I've got things like, please use lots of links. Make sure you're using a template. Um, how we use titles, always using positive language. Um, screenshots, no thank you. <laughs> They're a nightmare to maintain. I don't have automation on this. <laughs> Please stop screenshotting. Enter your name, screenshot of the name field. Enter your email, screenshot of the email field. Like, no, because if we reformat or refresh the front end, I want to replace all of this. So we only screenshot when there's something here that would really help a user if the button is somewhat hidden or there's something that we can do visually to help you see you are on the right screen when you see this. I also have some what not to do, um, things that catch people out. Um, and the list is like, no emoji, no exclamation marks. There's a third thing, but I can't imagine what that is. You can find it in the contributing file. Um, all of these are short, digestible, and they come with examples. The examples are mostly silly, and it keeps our content more or less feeling like people who've met each other have written it, <laughs> um, and that's very powerful. Our platform uses docs as code, which simply means the tools that we know and love from software engineering are so good we like them so much that we use them also for our documentation. So we're using the same tooling and the same workflows that you use when you work with code. This is reasonably existential, especially if you are working with um, colleagues who are from a more traditional documentation background, because they are m very likely to know other documentation tools and they might not be familiar with working with source control. They might not want to work in a text-based format, format all day. Um, trying to ask these questions at interview is tricky. I don't mind if you already know or if you're coming to us to learn, but if you are going to hate all programmer tools ever because they're stupid, like, this is probably the wrong job. Um, <laughs> so using the Docs' tool, Docs' code setup opens a lot of doors, and for me as an engineer trying to create something beautiful, I love this stuff. I can't, I can't imagine doing this any other way. Just like you can't imagine doing source, con doing anything without source control, code, to-do lists. Uh, is that just me? Documents. Uh, our blog posts are in a repo. That is how our brains work. So it makes sense, and all of the advantages for code are there for documentation as well. It's incredible to be able to work on loads of parallel changes all at once. I mean, and documentation is much safer for that because a change on one page very rarely affects a change on another page. Like everybody can just go for it on all the different sections. It's much less scary than when you do that on a large code base. One thing that I didn't think about at all when I proposed this tool chain is how much this helps us from a security perspective. 
I would describe our approach <laughs> to um, reviewing as relaxed, <laughs> as in it's an open repository, anyone can open a pull request, and anyone with commit access, which is basically anybody who works at Ivan and can use GitHub, can approve and merge that change. So, but what that does mean is because it's in source control and because it's immediately deployed all the time, security, the security team are very happy. Uh, we're ISO compliant, so um, knowing on this public website exactly what was live at any given moment and which employee approved and deployed that is very valuable. Um, we didn't have much audit on the previous knowledge base system, um, and this has been a really big win for a company where we're responsible for other people's data. We're pretty serious about who is doing what with what. <laughs> um, and that's something that we get for free because we're using source control. We're using GitHub. It doesn't matter if you're using something else. They're all, they all have the same benefits. Again, having that full change history, that full audit trail. Having tooling that is intended for collaborating on changes. Um, GitHub pull request reviewing collaboration tools are the best I have seen. A lot of documentation is done in a Google Doc or Word with track changes or some other such. Yeah, no. <laughs> no! We need to know what changed and we need to collaborate on each individual bit. And the tools are there. We use them for code, we developed them for code, but we can use them for docs as well. Working entirely in text-based markup is something I never, ever want to go back on. We're using a static site generator. For us, that's Sphinx. But if you're using Gatsby, Jekyll, Hugo, I don't know, I feel like there's new ones every day, you're looking at something similar. So the content is all in text files. You can work with it as a mass. Don't want to make out like I run said commands against my documentation a lot. But I could, and that's the important thing. For markup languages, um, I don't know if this translates. What's Goldilocks? What's she called in Danish? Something that's too hot or too cold or just right? For me, ASCII doc is the perfect markup language. It's descriptive, it's complete, it's correct, it's powerful, and it's a barrier to entry for normal people. I like it, but I've written books in it because I rarely use it. Probably most of you have used some sort of markdown. This thing is not enough. This is too little. It's not complete as a language in its own right. It's not easy to pass. You always need extensions. And different tools use different formatting and different standards, and it's hard. We standardize on restructured text. It's just right. I also have the unfair advantage that Ivan is a Python shop. So what we did already have in documentation was already in restructured text. Um, so we have a, a reasonable amount of awareness in the organization. Restructured text has a low-ish barrier to entry, a bit more than Markdown, um, but it is much more complete, and you can do really exotic things like tables. Um, and content reuse, it, it supports the include directive. If you talk to tech writers anywhere, they will talk to you about single sourcing, using a piece of content in multiple places, it's like documentation platform assisted copy paste. Sphinx and restricted text come with that built in, and it allows us to reuse content, not just within the docs platform, but also out across into the console or anywhere else that we need it. By having the markup in text, it doesn't include any styling or really anything. It's just content. The presentation stuff is completely separate. So people can rebuild the look and feel. This is allegedly happening at the moment, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, <laughs> people can rebuild the look and feel, and there's nothing to do to go back and reformat the content. It just gets, re just gets regenerated into the new templates. We could output it in different formats if we wanted to. I can't imagine why we did that. The biggest mistake we made on this project, I'm probably going to say this a few times, one of the big mistakes we made on this project, 
I don't have dedicated web developers for it. Um, I thought I could wing it. It hasn't scaled. Um, <laughs> so having people who can engineer your, your platform and care about all this stuff is really valuable. I talked about text-based markup, but I have also got to tell you the text-based diagrams are where it's at. If it was up to me, I would use GraphViz because I love it. Um, but we're using Mermaid.js, which is a little bit more approachable, and it produces diagrams like this one here. Um, and if we need to change the diagram, it's all defined in text. So we can change the label, the diagram will update, it will render, render differently for light and dark mode if we want it to. We don't have to find the original author or uh, try and Photoshop edit a diagram we've only got an image of and not the source files. We don't have to wait for the art department. This lets us ship and, and maintain and update really quickly. And I think it's, it's a small thing, but it brings me great satisfaction <laughs> to be able to draw the diagram and to do it in a way that is under source control and maintainable. I am super happy that we included this right from the start. I've worked on a few different documentation projects, so I had some unfair advantage at the beginning because I had made quite a few of these mistakes before um, <laughs> and therefore could avoid them on this project. Um, and yeah, Mermaid.js is very, it's just easy to edit. These are not the prettiest diagrams I've seen in my life, but I think it works. I want to talk a little bit about automating the Docs platform. And again, it's about using our engineering skills and tools and workflow and mindset and bringing it into a field where we often don't use it. Having continuous integration, I don't know why anyone writes docs that don't have continuous integration on them. It, <laughs> it seems really backwards to me now. I have worked on platforms like this. Having the pull request, um, have a build process for every pull request is incredible. The first thing it does is it verifies that it, we can build your branch. It's reasonably difficult to break the build with Sphinx. Well, it's, fair, it's fairly tolerant, but it is possible. So as a, and remember that we have a lot of not expert documentarian contributors. So I will summarize that as saying, sometimes things happen. Um, and we can, we can tell that that's happened. We can't build the platform anymore. We also generate a preview. Having preview builds on every pull request reminds me of when I first started working with um, design first APIs, where you can get the documentation before the work is done. Being able to preview that and de generate the docs. I mean, I like to generate the mock server and poke it with curl because that's how my API brain works. <laughs> but being able to generate something that everybody can look at really early in the process brings more stakeholders to the table. It includes more people, and we can get more input, whether they're non-technical or just too busy. To just, you can put the link in front of them and say, this is where we're going with the docs for the new product. Here's how the rewrite looks. Have a quick look at this, and put it in front of them. It's really valuable. The other thing that's super valuable about the generated preview is it means that people can just push changes to a branch and then see how it looks. I have a lot of casual contributors. Some of them are developers. They just push changes, fine. Quite a few of them are not. Um, but they ha we have a lot of documentation about how the account setup works with billing and teams and users. And all those people would previously have requested documentation changes. We've taught them all to use the GitHub web interface. So if they're just making edits or adding something, they know they can come, do that, push the branch, and have a look at the preview, check it looks okay, maybe have another try if it doesn't. Some of them try and run into trouble, and we fix it. 
but it means that they are welcome to come into the project and have some control and give their input. Because the preview is there, you don't have to be able to run the platform locally. We've set it up with code spaces as well, a few people using that one, but it's been very inclusive to be able to say, you requested some docs, I made the change, here is the preview, or to let somebody else just have a go. It shouldn't be exclusionary. I see our role as owners of the documentation platform as facilitators, not as gatekeepers. The preview is there because we were initially deploying to Netlify and it has a button for preview builds. Didn't really think this through, <laughs> but now I have it. I can't imagine running this project without it. We have a tool that checks hyperlinks. Um, because those things decay over time and we don't want to introduce any more broken ones. We ended up making a lot of changes to this. Initially, every build checked every link on the documentation site. This was fun with 50 pages. It's a lot less fun with 500 pages. Um, <laughs> it takes quite a long time and I think we're providing measurable load to some of our upstream projects that we link to a lot of the docs from. Um, so we had to change this, and the way this works now is the link, you can run the link check locally, it's just a make file command. Um, it also will accept a list of files to check. So we just pull the files that have changed in, these, in this branch and check those for every pull request. What if something breaks on a file we haven't changed? Yeah. So we ha also have a weekly job that runs the link check for the whole site once. It's a GitHub action automation. Um, I'll tweet the link later. My colleague Lysa wrote this great blog post about how we do it. Um, so it's, a, it's, an, it's an automated GitHub action that runs the whole thing. And if it doesn't get a success response, it opens as an issue and says, something's broken, there's the log. <laughs> So on a Tuesday, if we have broken links, it opens an issue, we all get the notification. So that's worked quite well as a very low contact way of checking everything looks okay. Um, previously, I have mostly waited for users to report that the link broken, um, and I'm quite like being ahead of them uh, with this. It does have the problem that if any of our upstream projects have broken their links, I won't name the one that takes out their latest hyperlink for 24 hours every time they do a new release. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but yeah, it causes our build to fail. So if it's them, we wait 24 hours and then rerun the job before we fix anything. Um, I'm not sure how to automate that, but I should probably work on it. The other thing we have is linting. Now, probably a bunch of you have done linting for code. There was a good talk about linting yesterday. I hope you saw it. Yarun's talk was, yep. Um, I have linting for pros, and especially because we are running this project, as with most of our projects, writing readmes or open source projects or internal wikis, we mostly operate without specialist language review staff. Vale is our pros linter, and it does a little bit of that for us. Um, Vale has a dictionary. It can check for valid words. You can also teach it your words. Like, yes, Kubernetes is a word. <laughs> Here is how you should spell it. It can also do product names with the correct uppercase letters for all those products that are proper nouns and some of them have capital letters partway through. It can learn those things. It can do a bunch of stuff. We just taught it a few tricks. The thing I'm really happy about is that we hooked this into our continuous integration right at the start of the project. And it did like two things. It does a few more things now, but it's always been in the build. People expect it to be there. Nobody gets upset that pretty much every branch you push to the repository fails the build. There's always something wrong. Um, we have a rule that all headings should be sentence case. Without really good technical writers as reviewers, we're going to miss this at review time. We are, we're human. And also, not merging someone's pull request when they've waited a week for a review 
because they've got a capital letter in the wrong place? Like, this is the sort of thing that puts engineers off writing documentation. Come on. So the robot does that. It's also much less annoying when the robot points out that you're wrong, because we're all accustomed to those automated checking, and it's simple enough for the bot to understand. Headings have to be in sentence case. We have checks for the correct use of product names and product trademarks. Given that Ivan is hosting, I think we're up to 11 now, upstream open source projects on a platform with a bunch of integrations, we need to be respectful of those projects' trademarks and use them correctly. Again, not everyone has read the guidelines of how to use the product trademarks in written content on behalf of Ivan, nor should they have to. <laughs> so we taught the rules to the bot, and it um, just prompts us if we've done it wrong. I find this very useful because I am the person who has read the instructions but can't hold the information when I'm writing about something exciting. We have Veil suggest replacements for frequent mistakes. Most of them are mine. Um, I can't spell Kafka at all, but I hear that CAC for project is very good. Um, <laughs> we have also recently banned all uses of the English word flick. Due to having Apache Flink <laughs> on our platform, the spell checker cannot pick up that this valid word is not the word that you meant in this context. <laughs> so we just made flick a, a suggested replacement that you almost always use flink. Sure, this is going to be annoying someday, but right now it has caught and saved us more times than it has got in anybody's way. Um, yeah, it's open source. Have a dig around in the rules. There are some amusing ones, um, but they're also... <sighs> Yes, we're a fun company. Yes, we're a, we're a cool new startup. But at the same time, we do want to look like we care. <laughs> so having a little bit of machine help with lots of contributors and a reasonably high velocity has been magical. We have continuous deployment. I feel like this kind of goes without saying, but um, the tech writers I work with found this whole thing very surprising. They would approve, but they didn't want to merge because that would cause the deploy. Turns out this is not normal practice in all parts of the industry yet. Um, immediate deploy is amazing. Somebody approves the pull request. We encourage the approver to merge, mostly because a lot of the authors are developer relations, so they're probably at a conference for three weeks. Just please merge it. If it's good, then it needs to go. We build the static site and we deploy, and we do that on a busy day, double digits. Um, in conference season, not so much. There's nobody in the office. <laughs> um, but having that ability to, we fixed, we've, we've spotted a problem, we can have it fixed in five minutes. We've, we've got product documentation in a branch ready to go, it's been reviewed. When the main platform rolls out the new product, I click the button, we're live. Meanwhile, the main website multiple people spending all day editing things in the CMS back end. <laughs> Continuous deployment is amazing. Um, we originally hosted with Netlify. We use a couple of their forms and functions as well. Um, pr probably some of you got caught in their repricing structure as well. I think we're moving this to AWS Amplify. Um, so let me know if I either definitely should or definitely should not be doing that. That would be good to know. One more thing that I think is remarkable about the way that we are doing documentation um, at Ivan and that I think makes this project and this talk more relevant to open source projects and their workflows than it might be is that our platform is open source. The docs are open source completely, including the pull request queue, the squabbling <laughs> in the pull request discussions, <laughs> the issues, like it's all in the open. Ivan has four technical co-founders. They're all upstream contributors. This is representative of who we are as a company. Um, the project's been live about a year. I didn't check it this morning. This is yesterday's screenshot. I had to update it. We have 88 contributors. Um, not everyone works at Ivan. Most people do. And of the ones that do, 
those contributors come from right across the organization. Um, the solutions architects uh, technically report into sales. They know everything. They've been amazing contributors. Um, the hard part is finding other people who understand it well enough to review. I've learned loads testing their content. I work in developer relations. We own the platform and we've done most of the migration from the old knowledge base, so we're pretty big contributors. Other people in marketing are making changes and especially helping us out with some of our user experience, some of our wording. Somebody's helping me with that information architecture problem. And they can contribute straight to the repo. We've got contributors from customer success, from support, obviously from engineering, also from product. Product has technical writers, product marketing get involved as well. So it's a very, it's a very open source operation. As well as being open source, it's, the content is Creative Commons. I mean, by attribution, we're a company, but it's Creative Commons. If this is useful, then you know, build on it. Move it forward. Let's be part of something, especially because we are part of the ecosystems of our upstream projects. We try hard to encourage our contributors. Uh, the repository is reasonably well organized. Um, we have clear contributor guidelines, readme's, code of conduct, um, templates. For what I find with the difference between the internal and the external contributors is people who rock up and contribute to the repository on GitHub who don't work for us know how to contribute to a Docs code repository on GitHub without any help. The internal users have a lot of domain-specific knowledge, but may not have any idea how to operate something like this. And so we do run internal onboarding and office hours for Docs contribution. And we find that people show up and say, I know what I want to do, but I'm not sure how to work it, or I don't know how to open this branch, or I've opened a pull request and the build fails and I don't know what to do now. So we do that internally. We're not doing it externally. I guess we could do someday. We try to have good review practice. This is hard because almost anyone in the company can review a merge. <laughs> and at some point, that's probably going to bite us. Um, but we try to be constructive, respectful. There's clear guidelines. The contributors can read the guidelines just like the maintainers can. And I think this cross-department, um, everyone being part of it, is really important. Because the contributors that feel included and can succeed today become our maintainers moving forward and start to take on aspects of the platform that probably I couldn't build myself. We run this as a principle of shared responsibility. There's no dedicated documentation team. Uh, for the most part, it is done by developer relations. You may have noticed this is conference season. <laughs> so <laughs> I wrote this message in our docs channel internally that said, hello, thank you for being lovely contributors. Please also be lovely reviewers. We will be back in November. Um, and so far, I've got to say, the rest of the organization has pretty much stepped up. Pull request queue is bigger than it is normally, but things are moving through. And the reason that we can do that is because we have guidelines for reviewers. We don't have a high barrier to having your change accepted. It is a documentation site. If we get it really wrong, we'll just fix it forward. You know, it isn't the, 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 the workflow that I have on this would scare me in a big way as an engineer, but it's appropriate for this platform. It makes sense for what we're doing here. Anyone with Git access at Ivan can merge. And this is intentional. We have Chase the Sun offices. So we have offices on every continent. The support and ops teams work out of hours. Why should you wait for European back office hours to get your documentation change merged? If you work in support and you want to patch the docs and send the link to a customer, just find another awake Ivaner and get it deployed. That's intentional. Not everyone's an incredible writer. The majority of Ivaners, although we use English at work, are not native speakers. So you can always tag your pull request for editorial review. And we do have some people that can help. It's just not required for every pull request. For me, it's about facilitating. 
There isn't a review board, there isn't a single point of approver, there isn't one team that can give the green light, because gatekeeping gets in the way of collaboration, and we can do so much when we do things together. The governance on this project is more about making sure that the quality and the consistency is there. It's not really about the direction of the project, because, <laughs> because documentation and resources are all of the directions all of the time and they should be. Engineering is about using tools to make experiences better. The motivation to create something great together and to use everything we know about good workflows, good collaboration, and yeah, good technical tools, all are part of the story. I think there's a lot here that I learned in doing it, and I hope that you found some of this useful or relevant to the things that you do. I will put this uh, slide of resources up. Um, I'd also like to remind you that I don't get invited back unless you rate the session. So that would be lovely if you could take the time. Um, and I will, with a little bit of time for questions, and I'll say thanks for your attention. <laughs>